Hi, Noshers. My name is Micah, the host of Not Your Bubby's Nosh, a conversation about your favorite and least favorite Jewish foods, your go-to source for holiday meal inspiration and a place to discuss and kvetch about which Bubby made it best. Today, I'm talking about something very controversial. It's a hot topic. It's polarizing. You might judge me regardless. I hope that you come at this with an open mind and try to see all the viewpoints out there. And today we are talking about gefilte fish. You may consider this offensive. You might consider the idea of gefilte fish just totally unappetizing. Maybe it's the texture, the taste, or just the fact that it's literally like a little fish ball suspended in a jar of jelly broth. It's possible you've only had it out of a jar and you've never made it from scratch. It's possible that it was kind of something that was an afterthought at your Passover Seder or at Shabbat luncheon. And it was just kind of like willy-nilly thrown onto a plate with a couple of spoonfuls of horseradish. And I I get it. I get it. And I have to tell you that I am a person who enjoys gefilte fish. Don't, don't come at me. It's, it's a personal preference. I actually really enjoy it. So today we're going to talk about what in the world is gefilte fish and who in their right mind invented it. We're going to touch a little on the Manischewitz gefilte hot dog controversy. Yeah, I said it. Then we're also going to talk about my personal experience with gefilte fish and the family recipe that made me fall in love with it. So if you're not familiar with gefilte fish, it is a unique recipe that was created out of scarcity. So gefilte fish is, it started as what's called a force meat of fish. And so force meat, which sounds absolutely repulsive, is basically just like, almost like how you're making a sausage if you were to combine meat, fat, and seasonings and blend it together to form like an emulsion or puree. And so that's like how you make sausages. You put a force meat into a casing and gefilte fish, you make a force meat, which is such a weird term. Um, and the fish that's usually used is a white fish, a carp, uh, or a pike. And some places go a little wild and do some like trout or salmon up in there to get a different color. But the word gefilte in Yiddish literally means stuffed. And that makes sense because it started out as a dish that was created to stretch ingredients, especially fish, which was more expensive. And families might not be able to afford a full portion of fish that is so readily available in today's supermarkets. So they would buy the fish or parts of the fish or fish bits or even just fish skin and they would mix it with fillers like onions and eggs, breadcrumbs, maybe some seasonings in there. Then they would chop it up really finely and stuff it back into the fish skin and poach it in a broth or water. And even some families, if they couldn't afford the fish meat, they would just make a stuffing, a fishless stuffing and stuff it into the skin for its presentation. So then that poached fish, stuffed fish skin was sliced and served. And this was a while ago. That's not like 50, 60 years ago. This was like in the 15th century, but by the 16th century, most most individuals abandoned stuffing it back into the skin because that was quite labor intensive. Um, and also why, uh, personally why. Um, and now it's most commonly served into like patties or balls and you can find it pr- pretty readily available at the grocery store and it's suspended in like a funky little broth gel, which sounds super appetizing. And so now that they're not stuffing it into the fish skin, it's typically like formed into balls and poached or shaped into logs and baked and then sliced and usually served with like horseradish. Uh, We always would put like a little piece of uh, poached carrot on top as well. So when it comes to the flavor of gefilte fish, something that's really interesting is that it can either be a little sweet or more savory. And so the preparation of gefilte fish is with sugar or with black pepper. And it's actually um, an indicator of where families 
came from. And there's something called the gefilte fish line. So if families were um, closer to the Poland side of of Eastern Europe, this is an Ashkenazi, an Ashkenazi delicacy, I would say, it's more likely that they would use sugar based on the rise of sugar beet farming during that time or during the early 15th, 16th century. Or if they were on the Litvak side, then it was more likely that it had pepper. And so there was like a little bit of a divide and a linguistic divide between sweet and savory gefilte fish. And that's something that a linguist, Marvin Herzog, discovered in the mid-1960s, which is really cool. And to show like how there's small nuances based on where you are and what ingredients are available. And of course, gefilte is born out of using what you have and using it to its best ability and in a way to stretch it and to make it appetizing-ish as well. So depending on where your family's from, if you have your own family recipe, and you see that maybe it's on the sweeter side or on the more savory, peppery side, that can be um, a little window into your family's history in terms of location. So back then, I mean, gefilte fish was definitely eaten out of economic necessity, whereas today it's eaten more as a traditional dish that we feel like we should just like put on the table, especially during Pesach. Now fish and food is so overproduced and there's large amounts of food waste and food available, especially here in North America. So it's not necessarily out of us trying to reduce our food waste or trying to stretch our stretch our food, but it is definitely more of a traditional dish. And whether it's for Passover or Shabbat, which it was also a common dish for, and we'll get into that next, it's it's pretty synonymous with with Jewish food, especially Ashkenazi Jewish food. So based on the religious side of it, where it's not just for, you know, fun to stuff a fish skin with fish and things, it's definitely a part of and came about because of Shabbat. And so observant Jews, like if you're not doing work, including like cooking, mixing and kneading during Shabbat, this is the perfect dish for you. So Fish was often the cheapest form of protein available. It was necessary to remove the bones ahead of Shabbat because that's not something that you could do because that is considered sorting, which I believe is known as work on the Sabbath. So they were able to sort everything and prepare it before the Sabbath and then poach it during Shabbat to eat the next day and it could be eaten cold. During that time, increasing the amount of breadcrumbs in the mixture could also help stretch it. And it was an economical source of protein and dish to serve. But it's not just in Judaism that people might be eating gefilte fish. Actually, in some Polish Catholic homes, gefilte fish is often eaten on Christmas Eve. There's like a 12 dish supper and on Holy Saturday because they're usually meatless feasts that include fish. So it's not just us. It's not just us who could be buying the Manischewitz gefilte fish. But let's fast forward to today. So in another episode, I I touch a little on the gefilte, I touch a lot on the gefilte dogs and gefilte fish pops that Manischewitz was marketing as I hope a joke. It was also started by a tweet that hot dogs are the gefilte fish of beef. And let's just let that sink in for a second. Hot dogs are the gefilte fish of beef. They are not wrong. (laughs) Let's just like come to that realization and conclusion that they are not wrong in saying that. And so when somebody posted that on Twitter, Manischewitz responded knowing that gefilte fish is a pretty polarizing food item. They responded by showing a photo, I hope just a rendition of or a mock-up of gefilte hot dogs in a packet, perfect for 4th of July, the ultimate Jewish American barbecue treat. And then later on this summer, they shared a gefilte dog 
pop, like a popsicle as well. So they are playing on the fact that gefilte fish is just inherently polarizing. You know, it's not for everyone. I'd say a lot of people are more polarized on fish in terms of protein. Many people just don't like it, which is totally fair to each their own. But I think that gefilte fish just kind of brings out its new, a, a new kind of dislike for fish and maybe it gives it a bad a bit a bad rap. So the Kafilta fish and hot dog mashup on Manischewitz was a really great marketing play and and play on how polarizing Kafilta fish is. But let's talk about why Kafilta fish is awesome. So in my family, my family, my mom's side, um, my great grandmother was a Ukrainian immigrant who fled in the early 1900s to Canada. And she found herself through a few stops, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and then finally in Northern Saskatchewan, where she worked as a fur trader for the Hudson's Bay Company, which is pretty darn cool. Being up in Northern Saskatchewan, she had access to some really great fish and fresh fish from freshwater lakes up there. And she was known for her gefilte fish. So she would make a homemade gefilte fish every year, which was, I mean, she would make it in huge batches and she would later teach my grandmother who would later teach my mom how to make this. And I just have memories of my grandma, Eva, mixing this massive bowl, like it could have been a kiddie pool, honestly, with her hands, this mixture of pike and pickerel, which was um, a a fish that was common in northern Saskatchewan with her hands, mixing away and always tasting it raw. And she would tell us that the only way to know if it's right is if you tasted it raw. And her mother never used measurements. It was all just by taste. So she could taste it and say, no, we need some more of this or that. We need less, a little less of this, a little more of that. She would then roll them into little balls and poach them along with circular cut carrots. And then we would serve it with the carrot on top with our half um, boiled egg and horseradish on a cute little piece of lettuce. And it was like a piece of art. And so this recipe for gefilte fish was really just passed on by feeling and taste and memory. So one day my mom when she was making it with my grandmother, wrote it all down to her best ability so that she would have an idea of what, of what to do, um, especially after my grandmother passed. So now my mom makes this gefilte fish and yes, she tastes it raw. I mean, now she'll use the food processor to make it a little easier on her. She doesn't make quite as much as a kiddie pool would allow, but she definitely gets the same type of fish from um, a special fish place, which like specializes in fresh lake fish, freshwater lake fishing. And it's this entire ordeal and she'll freeze these little balls and little pieces of broth or in little quantities of broth so that when I'm home visiting, I can eat eat them because I'm, I don't truthfully make it for my husband and I, because I don't think he would enjoy it. And I don't need 100 little gefilte balls in my freezer at any given time. So I think that I love gefilte fish because I never, ha- I've never had it out of the can or the jar. I've only ever had it at a time that it was attached to a story about my family, about my great grandmother, about her being this like badass woman in Northern Saskatchewan, buying and selling furs and then selling them to the Hudson's Bay Company and being like a really strong lady. And that gefilte fish recipe is something that's so ingrained that belonged to her that she did best and that she could pass down to the rest of the family as the matriarch. So I love gefilte fish. Like I like it obviously cold with like a thick layer of beet horseradish on top. And then my hard boiled egg on the side. Oh, it's so good with a big thing of pepper. And I do think that we put a little bit of sugar in ours. So maybe your disdain for gefilte fish is simply because you haven't had it done at home or you haven't had it done well dare I say? Because like, don't get me wrong. I love, I love a good shortcut. I love a good Manischewitz product, but I, I don't think I could bring myself to eat a jarred piece of gefilte fish because I'm so used to having it taste homemade and 
be exactly what I grew up with it being. So I do need to learn the recipe. I do need to learn to make it. And I do need to um, try that out perhaps this year. But this past year, this past Pesach, what I did instead of gefilte fish. So for context, my husband and I have lived on our own in a separate country, typically from my family for years. I haven't had a Passover with my family in about 12 years. And my husband had never had a Passover with my family. It's typically just the two of us. We'll usually invite a friend, friend or like a wander, like somebody who's traveling or a Jewish person that we meet or just non-Jewish friends. And we all watch Prince of Egypt and it's pretty nice. But this past year was the first year that we had ever celebrated Pesach with my family. So my parents came to visit um, for Passover and we had a Seder with them and some friends the first night. And then our friend's parents were in town. So we had them over the next night. And gefilte fish I know is polarizing and it does take a lot of work. And I decided to change things up a little this year. And I really had a good time with it. So what I did is I did something similar to gefilte fish. I took um, some white fish and pureed it with a matzo meal and egg. I added garlic, parsley, carrots, and onion that I had sauteed previously. And I formed those into little patties. And then I pan fried them in a little bit of olive oil and served it with a beet marinated hard boiled eggs. It was a beautiful pink and a horseradish and some little microgreens and dill. And yeah, it sounds super fancy, but I feel like it was probably a 10th of the work as normal gefilte fish was. But I will say that it was such a hit from people who typically don't like gefilte fish. And it, you know what? It had nods to the past and it had it definitely served the purpose of gefilte fish. And I think that moving forward, it's probably what I'll continue to do, or perhaps I'll take my great grandmother's recipe, scale it down a little, and then just pan fry it. And that can be a good way to introduce a gefilte hater to a gefilte fish that feels a little bit more contemporary and modern. And it was delicious. I'm not going to lie. It was fantastic. We made a bunch extra. They were great on salads throughout the week. I love the little beet eggs, which are super simple to make. And it was a really fun way to reinvent gefilte fish this year. So I feel like I'm going to get a question about how to make these beet eggs. So all you do is you hard boil eggs. I do like a little softer um, than super hard. And then I peel them. And then I put them into a container with um, beet juice and a couple tablespoons of horseradish and then maybe like a tablespoon of vinegar and fill it up with water so that they're all submerged. And then I just kept it in the fridge for a good 24 hours. And then that made them nice and pink and beautiful and a little bit of like zesty flavor, which I loved. And I, I mean, I just love horseradish in general. I eat it by the spoonful. So I know it's not yet Passover, but as we've learned, gefilte fish wasn't just made for Passover. It was literally made for any Shabbat. So maybe next Friday, try making little fish patties at home or gefilte fish patty at home and see and see how that goes and make them into little gefilte fish meatballs and put them on salad, cold leftover lunch on Saturday, or put them into a pita for almost like a little gefilte falafel, a, gefil, a gefalafel. Oh my gosh, did I just invent a new category? A f- gefilte falafel. I'm going to copyright that. I'm going to get a pat- patent pending on that puppy. Yeah, um, I love that concept. So yeah, so just just look for a way to incorporate one of these ideas or try making your own gefilte fish at home and see if you love it. And if you do, shoot me an email at micah at noshwithmicah.com or slide into my DMs and let's talk gefilte fish. Did you have a family recipe that you loved? Do you have a gefilte fish memory you want to share? I want to hear all about it because I love gefilte fish and I want to help you love it too. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you learned a little bit about gefilte fish, got excited to make your own, or even just to reintroduce it into your life if you feel like it had wronged you. Not Your Bubby's Nosh is a part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network and is produced by Jew Folk Inc. For more shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. If you've got questions, email me at micah at noshwithmicah.com.